Welcome back to the State of the World 2021 conference here at uh, Florida International University. I want to welcome all of you back. And uh, before we launch into the next panel, I do want to uh, express a, a, specific, a special thanks and gratitude to our IT colleagues, uh, Rigo Campos and, and Andre Rodriguez, without whom none of this would be happening right now. Uh, they are going to be working the entire week grateful for all they're doing and sorry I didn't give you long breaks but thanks very much guys and we'll, we'll acknowledge the other members of the team um, in, in due course. Our, our next panel as we can continue uh, today after a, a terrific morning and a start of these five days is focused on challenges at home, polarization and the forces pulling us apart and it's going to be moderated by John Decker. We're very pleased to have John here. He's senior national editor and White House correspondent for Gray Television. John is the only lawyer in the White House uh, press corps, and he also serves on the faculty at Georgetown University and the UCLA School of Law. So John, let me turn it over to you. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, David. Uh, and this is such a timely panel. I I'm, I'm so pleased to, to be able to talk to, to each of uh, the panelists who've uh, joined us here uh, early this afternoon. Lisa Massimino from Georgetown University, Larry Diamond from the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, and Richard, uh, who's at the Miller Center uh, this semester at the University of Virginia, and Martin Palosh uh, from Florida International University. Thanks to each of you for taking the time. And as I said, it's just so timely uh, in the sense that, as you all know, it seems like over the past four years, uh, all that uh, perhaps all of us have read about or, or seen about on television or heard about on the radio is about how divided our country is right now. And uh, I wanted to first go to, to Larry Diamond uh, out at Stanford, and thanks for uh, getting up a little bit early, uh, Larry, to join us. Uh, do you view, uh, view that the same way? Do you think that uh, America is more divided than we've ever been before? Or uh, is that a little bit of a stretch of the imagination, given the fact that uh, America has been divided? Uh, you know, when you think about the late 1990s, uh, another president was impeached, Bill Clinton. Uh, you could argue uh, America was divided then or divided during uh, the time leading up to the Iraq war. Is it different now in your view? Well. <laughs> John, thank you and good, uh, I guess, good afternoon to you. Uh, we're not the most uh, divided we've ever been. Uh, we were more divided during the Civil War. Uh, but I would say it's probably the worst political polarization that the United States has faced at least since the late 19th century and maybe since the Civil War. Uh, and it is certainly the first time you know, in my lifetime, and I really think uh, since the Civil War, that our demo that the polarization has become so deep that our democratic uh, institutions are being uh, implicated and eroded and challenged in fundamental ways. And I think you know the only parallel to the election cri the polarizing election crisis we've been through and that uh, remains unresolved in the sense that we still don't have uh, the defeated candidate for president uh, acknowledging it and conceding defeat. Uh, the only parallel one can summon uh, is the uh, 1876 presidential election crisis, which of course ended reconstruction and uh, saddled uh, American history with uh, m many ongoing problems. But even that produced more of a resolution than we have right now. And if I can just add one theme that I don't know if we'll have the time to pursue, John, but that I think is, is relatively new uh, in scale and in linkage to one of the two established political parties, one of my concerns now is that polarization is linked to and inducing tolerance for political violence to a degree that we haven't seen, uh, I think, uh, in many decades, if not over a century. We have a history of right-wing uh, extremist violent movements uh, 
uh, and white supremacist movements uh, in the United States, and of course, radical left extremist movements as well. But to have them resonating with uh, and seeming to be blessed or encouraged by leaders of one of the two great political parties, uh, this is very, very dangerous and disturbing. Elisa Massimino, let me come to you next, uh, because let's talk a little bit, if you could, about some of the reasons for the division that we see right now in the United States. And uh, you and I shared uh, some emails uh, over uh, the course of the past week, uh, and you ticked off some of those reasons, and, and perhaps you could go into greater depth about them. Uh, you talk about systemic racism. You talk about the legacy of slavery, about the degradation of facts, and the lack of shared experience and the inability to see ourselves in others. Uh, can we all essentially uh, look to those particular issues as reasons that we have such division? And Larry, we will get to uh, your issue about the violence aspect of things, certainly in our conversation, but uh, Elisa, if, if you can talk a little bit about um, what you view as some of the causes for this right now. Sure, sure. And uh, I just want to say I so wish that we could all be together in person uh, in Miami right now as I look out at the snow. Uh, but also, uh, I really am missing uh, the opportunity to interact in person with the students um, at FIU, who are really uh, the highlight, I think, of this program every year. As much as uh, I enjoy hearing from all the experts, I, I get great inspiration from the students there. So I hope that they are uh, coming up with their questions right now. Um, so uh, I do think, I mean, we could talk for uh, you know many, many hours about uh, the ways in which we as a um, society are polarized and divided. And there has been lots and lots written about that. Um, it's not a brand new phenomenon, of course. Uh, you could say for anybody who, you know, uh, watched Hamilton, you know, we've been pretty divided from uh, before day one on lots and lots of issues. Uh, but I think that the, um, the shift uh, most recently, you know, one of the things we, you know, we see is kind of the, the worst parts of human nature being enabled by, um, and those things have always been with us, you know, the pleasures of uh, othering and hatred and uh, the um, joy in being part of a tribe and, and excluding the other, um, the politics of personal attacks and, Obviously, the um, the uh, way in which um, uh, the internet and social media has um, kind of unleashed what was already there uh, and amplified it in a way that um, allows people uh, to group themselves around exclusion and hatred. Um, the politics of resentment, which the previous president was so highly skilled at, at mobilizing. Um, those, all of those things I think contribute to um, uh, the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, I have spent my whole career doing um, human rights advocacy, mostly in countries outside of the United States where I've seen you know, this movie before uh, in lots of uh, different iterations. But one of the, and, and I, you know, maybe it's an occupational hazard. I don't know, I guess you could go either way, but I, I am always trying to look for the bright spots. Um, and I hope we're gonna spend a fair amount of time talking about that because I've been fascinated. And um, one of the things I'm really pleased to, that Larry's on this panel because I've been talking a lot to my students about one of his projects, which I think is called America in One Room. Um, but there are a number of these uh, um, efforts going on all over the place right now that try to learn the lessons from what we've been, uh, you know, analyzing for quite some time about, you know, how we're divided, but really get underneath that and 
and ask questions about, you know, who is the we and how divided are we really? And what does the role of um, a lack of a shared uh, fact base have to do with the, the, um, the divisions that we're seeing now? I really hope we're gonna dig into some of that as well, John. Absolutely, Elisa. And let me come to you next. I'm curious to hear your views on this, on these subjects, number one. And number two, I wanted to get your sense as to how you feel uh, leadership plays a role in trying to mitigate or eliminate some of these divisions. Uh, does it make a difference that we have a new president now? Can that new president make a difference in trying to tone things down from the level that we're at right now across the country? Or do you think we're, we're past that? Do you think it, it doesn't even matter uh, who's in the White House or uh, who the leaders of the House and the Senate are? Well, I think we're about to see how much it does matter, especially in the area that I work on, which is uh, refugees and um, asylum seekers. Uh, you had in the past, the recent past then, candidate Trump coming down the escalator and mentioning as he declared himself a candidate, uh, Mexican rapists. And then as president also talking about the dangers of foreign born people, um, you know, equating uh, asylum seekers at the Southwest border with gang members and narco traffickers from Central America and people from the Middle East as terrorists. And, you know, really not wanting to bring people from shithole countries into the United States, preferring to have Norwegians uh, perhaps apply for asylum in the United States. So the president set a tone that was completely at odds with um, decades of Republican and Democratic bipartisanship in support of the US being a home for immigrants and refugees. Before um, uh, tr Donald Trump became president, there were people on Capitol Hill who were unhappy uh, about some aspects of the refugees coming to the US and I would come face to face with them. For example, when um, Jeff Sessions was a Senator, I heard some of the complaints, but they weren't a powerful force until President Trump got into the White House and Stephen Miller uh, was so um, hardworking in trying to uh, instill and successfully instill a comprehensive um, plan to shut down immigrants and asylum seekers and refugees coming to the US. So will a new administration change this? Yes, um, definitely that's the plan for uh, President Biden. Already in his campaign, he had very um, specific detailed plans uh, on the JoeBiden.com website of uh, things that would be done right from the get-go. And we see already then a number of measures being taken to counteract things that uh, President Trump had done and looking at executive orders and looking at draft legislation on immigration. And so what, I, what, what concerns me is it would be terrible if this became a ping pong match. When you have Democrats in office, you have one set of policies and when you have Republicans in office, it completely goes the other direction. And we've seen that happen on reproductive health policies uh, internationally. And so what would be much preferable is to return to that Cold War, War era understanding that Americans support uh, refugees and asylum seekers. And, and that's, I think that will be the test for the Biden administration. Can they not just change what happened during the Trump administration? Can they actually build some comedy back so that um, we don't have this uh, set of competing priorities? Martin, I, just a few weeks ago, I think it's a little over a week ago, hard to believe it's, it's a little over a week ago, is when we had the inauguration of President Joe Biden. And his inaugural speech was praised by both political parties. He uh, had themes of unity and bipartisanship. And since that speech, what I've heard from some of the supporters of former President Trump is that 
Joe Biden, in his early days of his presidency, has not followed through with that theme. And they cite the executive orders, the over 30 executive orders that he signed uh, in his first days in office. Uh, I wanted to bring in you because you have a very interesting experience, uh, experiences having uh, grown up uh, in uh, the Czech Republic uh, under a totalitarian government. And uh, is that a fair criticism of President Biden when those Trump supporters say that President Biden is not being um, bipartisan, that he's not showing the unity that he preached about during his inauguration speech. Martin, if, if you could, if you could um, unmute yourself because we can't hear you right now. Uh, it's, it's, you're, you're not there yet, Martin, I'm sorry. No, it's, it's, it's not, it's not um, working. It's not working. Uh, why don't you see if you can get that resolved? And I do want to go come back to you, Martin, but you're obviously your microphone isn't working. And in the meantime, uh, Larry, why don't you take on that question? If I could, obviously you don't have the same experience of growing up in an Eastern European country, uh, but you, you can talk a little bit about whether uh, that criticism of uh, President Biden is is fair criticism. Well, uh, you know, President Biden, uh, John, really faces a dilemma because uh, first of all, he was, uh, he inherited uh, you know, a series of urgent crises. And a lot of the actions that he is now reversing with his executive orders were actions that Trump implemented with executive orders. So I think to say that, it's Ill, that it was okay for Trump to pull us out of the Paris Climate Accords by executive order, but it's not okay for uh, Biden uh, to reinsert us is, uh, you know, is logically not a very persuasive argument. Uh, I certainly would favor uh, doing as much as possible by legislation rather than executive order for two reasons. Um, one is that it would <laughs> tend to uh, create a broader tent and, uh, you know, work against the current uh, polarizing landscape. But the other is it's more sustainable. If you pass something by legislation, it has to be reversed by legislation. If you do it by executive order, then four years from now, you know, Donald Trump could re reverse it again and we could be uh, playing ping pong for a long time to come. I really think the more interesting challenge here in a way is the one that's right before Joe Biden right now in terms of whether he's going to go for the biggest possible relief package with the most comprehensive adornments to it imaginable uh, in terms of what the Democrats are pondering adopting with their narrow 50 plus uh, vice president majority in the Senate, or whether uh, they try and negotiate with the 10 Republican senators who are proposing a uh, more limited package. I hope that the moderate 10, let's say, of uh, the Republicans in the Senate will be willing to negotiate rather than consider this $600 billion relief bill, a take it or leave it item. I favor the maximum level of stimulus, but I also think it would be much better for the country, A, if we could get something that Republicans and Democrats could agree on with 60 votes in the Senate, and B, if we could separate out some of these things so we're not trying to do everything in one omnibus bill. This is indeed a huge test. Martin, how's your, your microphone? I want to try to get you in. Oh, it's still, it's still not working, unfortunately, Martin. Uh, I'm very sorry. Uh, Lisa, Lisa, let me come to you because Larry raises a, a really interesting 
a question that we don't know the answer to. Uh, later today, I think it's about 5 p.m. Eastern time today, President Biden will be meeting with 10 uh, Republican senators. Uh, these senators, uh, some of whom consider themselves moderates, Susan Collins uh, is certainly a moderate, uh, Rob Portman of Ohio, an establishment senator who has announced he's not running for re-election, so doesn't have to fear political repercussions in terms of his actions. Uh, this test that is before uh, Joe Biden is an interesting one in the sense that he preached unity. Uh, at the same time, uh, he's being pulled in a certain direction by the Bernie Sanders wing of his party, which is saying, you don't need Republicans. We have this uh, procedure known as reconciliation. We can do this all on our own without any Republican votes, uh, get everything you want. That's what Republicans would do, uh, they argue, if they were in the same position you are. Where does Joe Biden, in, in your view, go with this? Is, is this, do you think, a difficult decision for him? Uh, or do you think that uh, he will be pulled in the direction of trying to find some bipartisan compromise? Yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I think it is a huge, huge challenge for him, but as it would be for anybody. Um, but Joe Biden is probably the best person we have in our political system right now to, to be the leader on that, on that challenge. To me, the thing is that, you know, the, the, the choice or the, the tension right now is that, you know, we need our government to um, recapture the muscle memory of compromise, you know, what, what it feels like to solve problems together. Um, we, we have very distant memories of that. Uh, and, um, and we have to find a way to reclaim it. So in a way, just as Larry said, you know, finding something that, uh, you know, incrementalism can be our friend, uh, that we can demonstrate that, you know, we are not irreparably broken, that we can uh, fix some things. And we, we need to do that for our you know, for ourselves and we need to demonstrate it for the world, frankly, because, you know, the, the problems that we are suffering right now are, you know, reverberating everywhere and undermine it, the, the concept of a functioning democracy. Um, so we need to create, you know, find some bright spots uh, and, and create more of them that we can use as kind of demonstration projects. But, <laughs> but, 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 uh, you know, priorities one, two, and three have got to be for the Biden administration getting a handle on the pandemic, and um, and getting the country healthy and back to work and back to school, and almost nothing can happen until uh, until the administration gets that moving um, and and builds some momentum. So to me, that's you know the the of course he should be meeting with the ten, and you know we have to make clear and, and, and Biden is the, the person, you know, to do that, um, that we can have dialogue and that we're interested in hearing uh, what people on the other side of the aisle uh, say and think and what their constituents, more importantly, uh, what their constituents uh, say and think and need. Um, but I, I think at the end of the day, you know, if we can't get move, the country moving again, back to work, get the economy back on track, we're gonna struggle with every other challenge that we have. Um, so, uh, you know, demonstrating openness and a listening ear and rationality, uh, but also realizing that um, he works for the American people. And let me uh, pick up on many of those points that both Larry and Elisa just raised. Uh, and that is the issue of uh, reaching out to the other side, uh, trying to find some sort of uh, bipartisanship that may exist on the other side. And as Elisa just uh, mentioned, the, the biggest issue on President Biden's plate right now is trying to get the US out of the health crisis that we're in. We're in a major health crisis all across our country. Uh, and so on that particular issue, as we saw, even though uh, on the face of it, you'd think that everybody would be on the same page, 
Uh, we're not. Different states, different governors have different approaches in terms of how they want to deal with this pandemic. The Florida governor, uh, Ron DeSantis, has a, a viewpoint which is uh, so different uh, from what we see uh, the New York governor, Andrew Cuomo, uh, want to go about in terms of dealing with the pandemic. So uh, Joe Biden is president. Uh, at the same time, we, we live in a system in which uh, we do uh, give so much of uh, power to the states. That's our system of government. So what can uh, Vice President, President Biden do, I should say, uh, do to, to reach out to a governor's uh, like Ron DeSantis uh, in terms of trying to get him on board uh, some of the federal protocols and procedures for dealing with the pandemic? I, I think what President Biden has going for him right now is um, that he's got a lot of plans and he's bringing in professionals who have the right backgrounds for the jobs. And he's got a wealth of people who have experience, have ideas, and um, are ready to mobilize. On the other side, you have a Republican Party that's going through uh, or continuing an identity crisis because you see these, these terrible um, counter pressures inside the party where uh, there's a question of how closely do uh, members and senators and governors ally themselves with former President Trump now that he's left office and how much do they speak out against him. And on COVID, which absolutely is the top issue, there's so much disinformation and misinformation uh, that has been pumped out uh, to uh, Trump supporters. And, you know, how do reasonable Republicans, you know, smart, experienced Republicans then position themselves to stay in office and still, um, you know, take steps uh, or push for steps that will um, get on top of this terrible scourge that has already killed so many uh, Americans. And so that I think is where there's a lot of tensions inside the Republican party. And, and this is where this misinformation, disinformation threat really seems to be fueling um, some of the worst aspects of um, what I consider Trumpism. You mentioned the tensions that exist in the Republican Party. Martin, let me try to come back to you uh, to see how your microphone is working and see if you, you've, uh, you've resolved this situation. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, perfect. <laughs> so first of all, I'm sorry for this uh, technical hiccup. I'm very happy to be able to participate in this discussion. Uh, certainly, uh, the question of polarization is a reality. But I would suggest is that uh, there might be two uh, kinds of uh, polarization. One is sound, which is part of a democratic process that people uh, have a different opinions, are able to address the issues uh, in a dialogue, identifying them from different perspectives. And then you might have an extreme polarization uh, that uh, is uh, maybe um, uh, reflected in still the situation in the United States now. In uh, my past, I remember very well what was the situation in our society let's say Czechoslovak society after 60, 68. We also had um, uh, appeals to unification after the crisis and this unification, uh, normalization of uh, Gustav Husak style was certainly not a democracy. It was uh, totalitarianism maybe uh, in a soft form but the totalitarianism that's of Havel uh, criticized very much because it was destroying human identity. Then uh, we experienced our unification in the context of Velvet Revolution, in the process of uh, unification of nation uh, for the sake of democracy. I think that all, everybody who's watching this panel 
and coming from this background, from this experience, uh, knows uh, what I am talking about. So here, what I only can say is, uh, really, we need to do anything possible to control ourselves, uh, to preserve a sound version of polarization that can lead us uh, forward. I am very much uh, hopeful that the President Biden's uh, message sent uh, last week exactly wants to go into that direction. Uh, let's hope uh, that uh, all these uh, resentiments of the past, uh, I understand that people who were supporting President Trump and people who were suffering uh, uh, in the past four years uh, have their issues and questions and maybe bitter feelings. But at the same time, I think that here now is a great challenge because democracy is at stake here in the United States, but around the world. And we need to find a way uh, how to uh, uh, do this right. I think that obviously brings me back also to my discussions and thoughts about freedom of expression. Uh, if you see the uh, case law of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, it gives us space for ideas that are offensive, shocking, disturbing. So we need to find a way how to bring in ideas we don't like, but at the same time uh, to preserve us, protect us against this type of polarization that leads nowhere. Solidarity, I think, is uh, the message uh, those who are, uh, I would say, participating in disseminization of Václav Havel's legacy as our program at FIU is trying to do, uh, program for human rights and diplomacy, should listen to this message and maybe start thinking more creatively how to go forward. Larry, let me pick up on some of those points that were just raised by Martin. He, he talks about uh, disinformation uh, in particular. Uh, we've seen over the course of the past year, but I think you can even go all the way back uh, to the 2016 election cycle about disinformation being spread by foreign actors. Uh, that, would you agree, has increased the polarization in the United States? And, and what can we do uh, about that situation, uh, particularly when social media spreads that disinformation by these foreign actors even further? Well, uh, John, let me uh, separate out two uh, issues in your excellent and frequently asked question. One is, what do we do about uh, social uh, media's role in inflaming and driving polarization more generally? And second, what is the role of foreign actors in, in feeding disinformation and deliberately manipulating, as we know the Russians did, these divisions, not only uh, with disinformation and misinformation, but just with uh, the insertion of uh, actors, um, trolls, um, who are misrepresenting who they are, claiming to be black activists or white supremacists, uh, uh, to, to, to just make the conversation more inflamed. Uh, clearly, this had a very uh, significant impact uh, in contributing to our polarization and the chaos and poison in the 2016 election campaign. But uh, the Russians would not be able to manipulate this if there wasn't explosive raw material to manipulate. Mm -hmm. And what I think we see now in the post-election crisis in the United States, and as we <clears throat> come to comprehend the scale of QAnon followership in the United States and other crazy, extreme, hateful uh, conspiracy theorizing that is thriving on the internet, is that this doesn't need and isn't primarily being driven by foreign mischief and amplification in order to become as destructive as it has become. So what we need is for the social media companies uh, to more aggressively moderate content 
and not just remove things, but demote things. We now have known for many years that the business model of the social media companies uh, is similar in a way to um, the old uh, summary statement uh, about uh, journalism in the yellow journalism era. If it bleeds, it leads. You want screaming headlines to attract readership and you want controversy, outrage, anger, and emotion in order to fixate people's attention on those platforms, Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube, uh, Instagram, whatever it might be, so that uh, you can not only sell more advertising revenue by having people on your platforms longer, but so that you can collect people's data and commercialize that uh, because, of course, now the most trite but also correct phrase we can uh, say in the digital age is that data is the new oil, and, and it is, and that's where the revenue is coming from. So social media companies need to accept the social responsibility of um, moderating content and demoting and trying to isolate uh, and even remove more hateful and blatantly false content uh, in order to, to save our democracy. And I have to say, when you have a political actor who is encouraging uh, violence and committing such um, willful, blatant, outrageous, uh, and unrestrained uh, emission of falsehoods as Trump was, I think Twitter did the right thing to uh, remove him from their platform. And if I can say so, because I generally think uh, uh, that um, uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel is, uh, you know, one of the most admirable and responsible, responsible um, political democratic leaders in the world now, but it takes a lot of nerve for uh, a German chancellor to say that we shouldn't be censoring a uh, political actor in the United States when Germany has laws that prevent uh, 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 Nazi voices from denying the Holocaust, for example. Elisa, let me come to you on that issue of social media. Uh, social media companies, obviously uh, President Biden, the Biden administration, Congress, they have so much on their plate, uh, a health crisis, an economic crisis. And now Larry's uh, spoken about a need to focus to a certain extent on some of these social media companies. And uh, it seems that both President Trump and President Biden appear to be on the same page as it relates to one section of the Communications Decency Act of 1996, Section 232. Is, is that an answer? Does, does that help solve the problem? It obviously doesn't solve the problem, but uh, should Congress take a look at perhaps uh, rewriting uh, the, the Communications Decency Act and taking out that portion of it so that social media companies don't have this ability to disseminate uh, disinformation all of the time, 24-7, uh, that we've seen over the course of the past few years. Well, I, um, I, don't, I, I don't know if that's the right stick, but there but absolutely there needs to be regulation uh, of, of the industry. And um, primarily getting at, you know, the point that Larry raised that, you know, the business model um, for these companies is to channel people into extremity <laughs> uh, because it creates clicks. And, you know, we, we, we really, uh, as a country started looking at this um, more in the context of preventing, you know, violent extremism and terrorism from abroad to look at, you know, what happens, how, how does YouTube and, um, and Facebook and Twitter channel uh, inquiries from people who say, you know, how do I make a bomb or, you know, is there a Jewish conspiracy to run the world? Or and, and instead of debunking those things or sending people in more positive, it 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 affirmatively sends people down 
um, an extremist rabbit hole because they'll spend more time online and they'll make more money for these companies. So the algorithms are um, in, you know, directly undermine uh, the kind of culture that we need for democracy to work. Um, As Larry sent uh, in a instant message to me, I misspoke. I meant uh, section 230, not section 232. Larry, thank you for, for correcting me on that. And Anne, let, let me come to you uh, on this issue of social media. Uh, it seems that uh, some uh, individuals on both the left and the right uh, are blaming social media companies for uh, what we're seeing right now in America. So the divisiveness that we're seeing in America, uh, that, that can't be right. I mean, social media uh, didn't exist uh, when, as Larry cited, the Civil War was around and uh, the election of 1876. It, it just can't be social media companies alone that's a, a cause for all of this divisiveness. Is it just simply that they're elevating it, that they're amplifying it? Something's going on because I was struck that in the waning days of the Trump administration, when Twitter took the decision to turn off uh, President Trump's uh, feed, there were all these charges of censorship, even though President Trump had a briefing room with a permanent uh, set of reporters, uh, you know, staffing it, um, and could go on uh, and get messages out like no one else on earth. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it wasn't censorship of, of communication, but it was censorship clearly of a type of communication that was very, very important to him because I guess it left over, um, you know, the middleman, the media. And so I, I know we're not supposed to put the moderator on the spot, um, but I'd like to for, for this aspect of the conversation sure. of, you know, how do you all in the media, you know, think about these issues? How do you work these issues? What I thought was interesting was, I think over the course of the Trump administration, uh, the press got more bolder in, um, you know, labeling misinformation as wrong. And in fact, you know, we saw this conversation about baseless claims about the election. And then people writing in say, well, you should say false claims about the election. And I'm thinking, well, those are both pretty tough words. <laughs> I thought it was a, 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 quite a step forward that the press was you know, pointing out when things were factually incorrect. So could, can you step aside from your moderator role and, and take a stab at, you know, how comfortable or uncomfortable you all are as journalists and addressing some of this misinformation? Well, it's, it's a good question, Anne. Uh, I'm uh, old school in the way that I approach my job as a reporter in the sense that uh, I'm probably the only person in the White House press corps that does not tweet. I don't even use Twitter. Uh, and so that's really old school. Uh, I don't want my viewers, my audience to have any idea uh, about the way that I think about a particular issue. I try to uh, present my stories, my reports in such a way that uh, I'm just conveying information to the audience and I let the audience make their own determinations about how they feel about a particular issue. Uh, that's the way I've, uh, I was taught and I, I think that's the way it should be. And to get to your question, uh, when you're in the media, particularly when you're covering the White House, you're very reluctant uh, to call the president uh, a liar mm. or to call something that the president tweeted or the, something the president said a lie. That's a pretty strong word. It's sometimes you know, it may go to the intent of the individual and we, some, we obviously can't get inside the head of the president. Um, that being said, I agree with you over the course of the of the four years that Donald Trump was in office, uh, you know, we we in the White House press corps uh, felt that we uh, oftentimes were not being told the truth. Uh, that sometimes the people speaking on behalf of the president or the president uh, himself uh, were saying things to us that we knew 
was not right, that we knew was not the truth. And that I think compels uh, reporters uh, to call it out, uh, to you know, speak as they say, truth to power. And that I, I think is what ultimately happened towards the end of the Trump administration where you had um, reporters that were representing news organizations uh, that may be viewed as uh, sympathetic to the Trump administration like Fox, uh, calling out the president, asking tougher questions of the president that we had not seen uh, earlier in his term. Um, and so uh, that's a good thing. Uh, I think it, it sends the new ad administration, puts them on notice uh, mm -hmm. that you know we're gonna hold people's feet to the fire uh, you can certainly, in 2020 hindsight, argue that's what you should have been doing from the beginning of the Trump administration, and I understand uh, that criticism completely. Uh, but you know, this was a, an administration unlike anything any of us had ever covered before. You know, this is a president who uh, was tweeting dozens of times a day, and we often were forced to cover his tweets. You know, to fact check tweets, that's something that we were uh, never doing during the uh, Obama administration. He tweeted from time to time, uh, but uh, nothing like we saw with President Trump. And so going forward, uh, it's, it's a return to normalcy uh, in terms of what we saw during the Obama administration, during the George W. Bush administration, even going back to uh, the Bill Clinton administration, which I also covered, in the sense that there's more predictability, uh, more predictability in terms of what we can expect and should expect from our president. And uh, will we return to uh, what we saw under President Trump? Um, obviously, I can't foresee the future. I don't even know if President Trump will run for president uh, again in 2024. But I think it has made us all who cover the White House think uh, long and hard about how to cover an administration, if it ever happens again, that's not truthful uh, with us on a variety of issues. So hopefully, and I, I answered uh, your question on that, which Thank takes you. me uh, uh, to another topic that Martin um, threw out at me in an email that we exchanged with one another, and that is uh, what will happen next week. Impeachment, the second impeachment trial of President Trump. Uh, and there are those on the right that say, uh, this second impeachment trial is, it's unnecessary. It only causes more division in this country uh, that, uh, you know, let bygones be bygones. Enough is enough. Uh, Donald Trump is no longer the president. Martin, how do you feel about that? Is this um, an impeachment trial that is necessary? Uh, should uh, the, the actions of President Trump have consequences? Uh, and this does not go to how you feel, you know, guilt or innocence in regards to the article of impeachment, but rather uh, the procedure itself of having an impeachment trial. Uh, first of all, I think that there is a constitutional question here. Uh, I'm not an uh, expert here, but I can imagine that we'll hear both arguments uh, that it is compatible uh, with the uh, US Constitution, uh, unprecedented uh, situation, but uh, com compatible with basic principles. Others uh, will be uh, saying uh, the opposite. So we may have a very qualified uh, discussion among constitutional lawyers. But I think what is more important is a pragmatic aspect of uh, the whole procedure. Uh, I, I'm not, uh, I would say, ardent supporter of any uh, school of uh, thoughts here. But I think that everybody uh, should raise a question how can we get reunited uh, in basic democratic principles? If the argument is to uh, not allow Donald Trump to run again, I understand that. Uh, and uh, I think that he would be a very bad choice for any circumstances. But still, I think it would be much better to let democratic process uh, um, going forward and focus on current uh, important issues and don't pardon uh, US Senate uh, that is now uh, in that uh, very fragile situation, first efforts to go, uh, to reach out to the other side are happening. 
that it can be again uh, brought back to uh, the square one when uh, the Donald Trump, who has occupied the attention uh, of uh, the American public for, for years, will be still uh, in the center of headline news. Larry, constitutionally, uh, the US Senate must take up uh, this article of impeachment. Uh, but if we could go back in time a few weeks uh, on January the 13th, that's when this one article of impeachment uh, was voted on by the House of Representatives. Uh, should the House have, have, have gone down that uh, road? Uh, was, was that something that was, in your view, a necessity? Uh, do you believe that this impeachment process against a former president, now a private citizen, uh, is the, the proper way to go about punishing uh, former President Trump. Uh, wh what's your take on some of these arguments saying uh, that we should just let bygones be bygones and move forward? I'm strongly in favor of impeachment. I think he should be convicted and barred from ever holding public office again. I think uh, there should at least be uh, an exploration of criminal charges against him for incite incitement uh, to riot. Uh, let me put it this way. Um, on January 6th, the United States of America suffered the most grievous attack on its constitutional system from an internal challenge, uh, I think, since the Civil War. Uh, it, it's very clear if you listen to the language, it's clear to me anyway, but that's what a trial is for, is to determine this. Uh, but I think there's certainly strong and compelling evidence that Donald Trump knowingly incited this crowd, uh, not only to march to the Capitol, that he literally did, uh, but to encourage them to fight like hell. And if you follow the history of Trump, he uses code language in a brilliant demagogic way, uh, the signaling message to the Proud Boys to stand back but stand by, and so many other dog whistles to white supremacist groups over the years. Um, I personally think that as um, serious a political crime, I don't think it's prosecutable under law, but I think it's prosecutable under the impeachment provision of the Constitution as the incitement uh, is the fact that he then retreated to the White House uh, by reports that we have. Again, uh, this is what you uncover in a proceeding. He sat there and for hours watched this riot on television uh, with people asking, where's the vice president? And we've got a noose uh, with which to hang him. Uh, and people looking for uh, Nancy Pelosi uh, to arrest and probably execute her. And he didn't lift a finger to try and get um, uh, security forces there to, to rescue the situation. And of course, we know that um, it took hours for the Pentagon to approve the dispatch of National Guard troops. So uh, Donald Trump as president uh, was sworn to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. And I think he willfully uh, violated his oath of office. And that justifies the extraordinary measure, not only of impeachment, but of uh, conviction and barring from office, even after he's formally left office. Elisa, we've been speaking about the divided nature of America, but there's also a divided nature of the Republican Party. Uh, we saw this in the House impeachment vote. Uh, just 10 House Republicans uh, voting on that one article of impeachment. We saw this in this procedural vote that took place uh, just last week in which just five Republican senators even view this impeachment trial as constitutional. Uh, is this essentially an important inflection point for the Republican Party uh, in terms of what it is as a party going forward, this impeachment trial. Uh, what's your view on that? Well, I absolutely, I think it is. Um, and we've been, you know, kind of watching the, um, uh, the progress towards a reckoning in the party for quite some time now. 
you know, going back to uh, the Tea Party and um, and and the you know fight around uh, the Affordable Care Act, and so yes, and I think that you know we, it's one of the things lessons that I think we have to take away from uh, the attempted coup on uh, January sixth is that. We, we have got to take a serious look at the weaknesses in the structures of our democracy and, um, and build up more of a bulwark against you know, the, the weaknesses that have been exposed now. Um, so you know, I, I would love for us to spend a little bit of time talking about that, about you know, kind of where do we go from here? You know, one, as you said, John, is about you know, the future of of the Republican Party, and therefore the two-party system in our country, um, and I think you know that's one of the reasons why I think it's really important for uh, President Biden to be meeting with these ten that are reaching out now on this. We've got to show that there is some political upside to uh, compromise. You know, it's I don't know if people uh, know this, but on the House side, um, you know, where you have caucuses of every different type, the, the cattle caucus and the equality caucus and the black caucus and all is a problem solvers caucus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As if it's a special interest group inside Congress <laughs> that <laughs> is gonna focus on, isn't that what they're all supposed to be doing? <laughs> and we have, to, <laughs> we have to make the, you know, uh, look at what uh, structurally, are the impediments to problem solving in our country. One, of, one set of problems is about the structural. Uh, I saw somebody asked a question about, um, about money in politics and that is a huge thing. That, um, but there's all kinds of things, the question of the filibuster and the question of you know, campaign finance reform. The um, American Academy of Arts and Sciences did a really interesting report recently called Our Common Purpose, Reinventing American Democracy for the 21st Century. You can't see it because I have that weird thing, but um, it's got great ideas in there. Um, and I think uh, I'd also like to hear more about this America in one room, but you know, here in my home state of Maryland, there's been a ton of polling that shows that Americans actually, um, if not, violently agree, uh, have a basic consensus about the way forward on some of the most, you know, commonly thought to be the most thorny problems that we, that, uh, that we're facing now, police reform, immigration, healthcare, the environment, social security, sentencing reform, the postal service even, you know, that there are um, areas of consensus that are really quite you know, refreshing and um, and surprising, mm -hmm. uh, and that is where I think we our our leadership, political leadership from both parties, needs to be focusing on, so that we can start to rebuild this sense of agency about our own our own problems, and not uh, you know coincidentally, if you look at the agenda of the Problem Solvers ca uh, Caucus. Uh, it's many of these issues because people know that their constituents, once they are, you know, separated from the um, much of the noise that's happening in Washington, um, you know, Americans actually have a fair amount of common sense. Um, just that their their uh, access to the facts is impeded, um, and. Uh, and their voices are are muffled. So we have to fix those things. And that I think will strengthen, and both parties have an interest uh, in that going forward. And why don't we uh, take Elisa's suggestion and look ahead and try to figure out uh, ways in which we can uh, come together. And uh, I'm, I'm an optimist by nature, uh, but I'm also a realist. And you know, for me, uh, the events of January the 6th uh, re really hurt me as an American to see that happen uh, in, in the people's house and the nation's capital. Uh, and it, it seemed to me it was uh, the first time in, in a long time in the aftermath of what happened on January the 6th that I heard the leader for Republicans in the Senate chastise President Trump directly. 
Uh, is it up to leaders uh, like Mitch McConnell in the Senate, uh, as well as President Biden, uh, to work together to find some of those areas of, of commonality, some of the areas that Elisa touched upon? Uh, is that is what necessary, or does it happen um, you know, organically from the ground up? Uh, do we need to look to our leaders, essentially, uh, to, to find solutions to, to bring us together? I think there are areas, even in the last uh, several years, where there's the potential for working together and doing some good work. And um, one area is human rights and especially um, countering human trafficking, for some reason has real appeal on both sides of the political aisle. Mm -hmm. The problem I have with that is that the crises we're facing uh, globally right now. So there's the US impact, domestic impact of things like COVID and economic um, uh, problems and um, uh, the social unrest um, and you know problems in the US with uh, um, the police uh, going against minorities. Um, and then there's the international brand of that. <laughs> uh, many of these have international aspects or repercussions or, or relatives. Um, and so, you know, making progress on human trafficking would be fantastic and having bipartisan approaches to that um, or, or having bipartisan voices on human rights the way the Tom Lantos Commission does in the, in the House of Representatives, great, uh, but it's not enough to really deal with some of these real mega that um, we're seeing around the world right now. Larry, let me come to you with that, that same question. Uh, one individual that I didn't mention that I will mention now is another congressional leader who has seemed uh, over the course of the past week to walk back some of his initial criticisms of President Trump. And that is Leader McCarthy, the leader for Republicans from your state of California. Uh, what's going on there, uh, number one? And, and, and number, number two, uh, is, is the House a lost cause? After all, uh, the new members of the House are typically from the far left and the far right. And there, there it seems these days, there, there are very few new members who are elected uh, who would immediately join that so-called problem solvers caucus. So what, what's your view on, on that? Do you view the house as a, a lost cause or do you think that, that there's hope uh, for finding that middle ground uh, that may be necessary in some of these really tough issues? Well, first of all, I, I think this now gets us to the core driver of our uh, political polarization and dysfunction in Washington uh, John, John, but first a modest correction. There were actually quite a number of moderate Democrats uh, elected uh, for the first time in 2018. Elisa Slotkin, uh, Abigail Spanberger, uh, Susan Wilde in Pennsylvania, Jason Crow. So I don't think it's, um, it's correct to say that only, uh, you know, the extremes are, are the new people entering the house not many Republican moderates, but there is a trend increasingly uh, of immoderation in terms of who's getting elected anew to some extent in the Senate, but more strikingly in the House. And there's a very simple reason for that. And it's the same reason uh, that Kevin McCarthy went down to Florida ki to kiss Donald uh, Trump's ring. And it's the same reason that um, uh, uh, roughly 140 members of the House of Representatives uh, voted to challenge an electoral result uh, that most of them knew was a legitimate election result on January 6th. And that is that the way you get elected in the United States of America in our electoral system is that you first have to win a low turnout party primary in order to contest in a first past the post general election. And that combination is leading people in both party to play to the extremes because it's the extremes 
that dominate voter turnout in low turnout party primaries. And that must change in two ways. I think the most important way is we desperately need ranked choice voting uh, in the United States to make it possible for voters to have another option and not waste their vote on an independent if the parties are giving them uh, extreme nominees or if you have a situation like um, in a safe democratic district in New York or a safe Republican district somewhere else or state where the party nominee is very extreme but there's no chance of the other party winning an independent might win. And if you had ranked choice voting, people could vote for an independent uh, and not waste their vote. If that person didn't make it, their vote would be transferred to their second choice. I think there is great promise in the electoral reform that the state of Alaska adopted by voter initiative this past November, which is probably what's gonna enable Lisa Murkowski to get reelected uh, despite her uh, moderation and the fact that um, she's already been punished once by losing a Republican primary. She had to come back and win uh, in 2010, I think, uh, with a write-in vote. And in Alaska now, they'll use a top four system going forward, where the top four candidates in a blanket primary, a nonpartisan primary, advance to the general election, and then uh, voters use ranked choice voting to select the winner. I think if we had this system, top four, top five, with ranked choice voting uh, in a number of states uh, in the United States, you would see a lot of Republican members of the House and Senate emboldened to be much more moderate, responsible, and flexible. Martin, let me come to you on that same issue um, that uh, Larry, Elisa, and Ann have spoken about, uh, this issue of trying to find uh, a common ground and B, uh, whether uh, I, I asked the question whether the House of, of Representatives, in terms of being uh, a moderating force, a, a, a voice for leadership, is, is a lost cause, uh, given some of the facts that, that Larry uh, just ticked off right there in terms of how many uh, House Republicans in uh, the most recent vote that we saw uh, take place there. Uh, indicate that they viewed uh, the election, which was free and fair, as one that was uh, rife with fraud. What's your uh, take, Martin? Uh, first of all, uh, I'm an old man, but at the same time, relatively young American citizen. I got American citizenship a year and a half ago, uh, so my experience is not, I would say, uh, deep enough. I would like to remind you uh, the name of this conference, the state of the world. It seems to me uh, that uh, both sides should uh, start uh, from deeper questions and not uh, just their, I would say, uh, imminent current beliefs that makes them a uh, uh, member of this or that party. Uh, I think that uh, moderation certainly is the only uh, solution but uh, the question is how we can weaken extremists and uh, support moderates on both sides. I'm simply not believing that uh, you can, by el eliminating uh, some people or doing some sorts of tricks uh, so that maybe uh, they lose their support is the solution. I think the solution is really a democracy on grassroots level, the capability to discuss the issues and not uh, only be uh, uh, put into these uh, stronger streams of party politics. If I can speak here about uh, Florida and the issue I'm very much in favor of, which means, uh, let's say, um, human rights in Cuba and uh, some other Latin American countries. What I'm hearing now is that Cuban Americans on both sides, uh, Republicans and Democrats, would like to listen to each other better and um, uh, try to uh, come up with their own solution. I don't think that it will uh, make them uh, more democratic or more Republican, but I think that better communication between uh, both parties is the only solution. And it's high responsibility of the leaders of these parties uh, to support uh, this process. And 
the visit of uh, uh, Governor Carty uh, to Florida. I understand uh, why Larry is so, I would say, uh, appalled by that. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not advocating uh, Donald Trump's past. It's very important uh, to uh, look around and see what other people think and maybe giving them helping hand, telling them that their agenda is not lost, that is not going to be suppressed by very uh, loud uh, uh, participants in the current uh, discussion uh, in the United States today. I only can end up with my center European experience. Uh, both uh, parties, both sides need to work together if we want to stand against challenges of autocratism, totalitarianism that are real today. Uh, and that's, uh, we need to find some way how democracy and the United States as a beacon of democracy is still here and uh, sending the right messages to the world. Larry, Elisa, Anne, let me get you each to respond to what Martin just said, because he raised up uh, some interesting points that we had not heard before. So Larry, let me come to you first. Well, uh, I know we're running out of time. Uh, I agree that um, leaders always in the breakdown of democracy or the rescue of democracy, uh, John, play a disproportionate role. And so I think there is a huge historical burden now on both the congressional leaders and uh, the president and his team to try and find common ground. On that, I really do agree with Martin, with Elisa, I think with the whole tone of the panel, of course. Of course. And um, this is why I, I'll just say, uh, on the one hand, I actually favor uh, eliminating or greatly narrowing um, uh, the, the use of the filibuster. I think it's become a chronic reflex that's contributing to our political dysfunction. But on the other hand, I'd like not to use the nuclear option right now to try and get a COVID deal. And I think that we need to demonstrate, I think this was Elisa's point, or it could have been Anne's earlier, I forget. We need to demonstrate that it is possible to get bipartisan cooperation on legislation to address our major problems. And so I think this is the urgent question now as to whether that group of 10 can be met by the Democrats um, with some kind of compromise that, you know, can demonstrate that bipartisanship is possible again on Capitol Hill. Let me come to you, Elisa, next, uh, and follow that and keep in mind our, our time constraints here. Uh, well, um, I think uh, Martin covered a lot of things there, but I, I do think that our, um, our democracy is, you know, in the scheme of things, not that old. And uh, it's totally reasonable to expect that we need a tune-up. You know, we need to look at the things, uh, new ideas for how to, you know, engineer a future where we can solve problems. And, and therefore, you know, going back to Martin's point about, you know, this is about the state of the world. And this panel has been very, uh, you know, focused on the state of our country, but those things are not disconnected. Um, and, you know, so there's a lot at stake, uh, even more than what we've been talking about on this panel uh, for us uh, getting this right. You know, I, um, I'm right now reading uh, John, um, uh, Mark Salter's uh, excellent book on uh, uh, the luckiest man on, on John McCain, um, who, and I'm being reminded reading that book of someone who was an absolute master at bringing people together around shared values to solve problems. Um, and we need, you know, this is a, a, a conference at a university. We need to prioritize in education of, uh, of our future leaders um, examples of compromise and problem solving. So I'm hoping that students are going to take that away from this panel. And very quickly, um, yeah. yeah, very quickly, I think that President Trump was uh, modeled some really bad behavior to other countries. 
Uh, and I saw this in the um, treatment of migrants and uh, building walls, uh, turning people away that of course it was completely what Eastern European authoritarian regimes wanted to do. Um, you know, we saw this in how he soft peddled uh, uh, some of the thing, reprimands he should have been uh, live, levying against uh, Putin in, uh, in Russia. And so that has undermined, I think, America's voice in talking to other countries. We're much more powerful when we have um, uh, messages that don't vary from administration to administration, but instead are really strong and rooted in um, our principles. And so I think the Biden administration is going to have to, you know, not just talk, talk to bad guys, but also try to make clear that this is not a temporary aberration that we feel this way, but these are core American values and, and get that across. And the more that that can be backed up by um, Republican leadership, I think the stronger those messages will be. Well, this was a terrific panel. I wanna thank each of you for uh, taking the time to uh, be on this panel, to offer your thoughtful insights uh, and to, to look forward. It sounds uh, like uh, all of us are, are on the same page in terms of uh, what we hope will happen in, in the near and, and distant future for the United States. Martin, Larry, Elisa, and Ann, thank you so much. And uh, David, uh, I throw it back to you. John, thanks so much. Um, terrific job moderating. And thanks to, to Larry, Ann, Elisa, and, and Martin. Um, terrific panel. I really, really appreciate it as we continue uh, on this uh, conference on State of the World 2021. We're going to take a, another short break. And when we come back at 2 p.m. Eastern time, we will be joined by former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, and uh, then after that, we will have our last session of the day with Congressman Ted Deutsch and Congressman Adam Kingsinger. Thanks again for a wonderful panel and we'll be back soon. Thank you. The environment the students are facing today is unlike ever before. all about team-based work in the 21st century of careers. Being able to do teamwork and compromise on their positions, play the role of different sectors, the public, the private, the nonprofit sector, with different strategic priorities and being able to combine them all and superpose them into an initiative that truly adds value to all the organizations and the actors involved. The way that we communicate has changed. But more and more we're bringing in professionals, who have a skill set that combines with the academic expertise of other faculty members that really make a difference. I want to be able to remove the fourth wall between the classroom and the world around us. The different experiences that the faculty and the masters has were fundamental to really understand what I needed and to gain these different points of view to become a better professional. One of the most important dimensions and it's really the crowning achievement of the program, is the capstones. Capstones, for me, as somebody who comes to this work in international affairs as a practitioner, I think is one of the best parts of the program. The value of what they did in the classroom is manifest in this particular capstone project. It allows them to take everything that they've learned in our program up until that moment and practically apply it. It allowed me to develop and create innovative solutions for the corporation I work with. It was an opportunity to understand how corporations really integrate corporate responsibility into business operations. The students are working directly with the policymakers. Really prepare me with the tools and skills needed to succeed at my former position at Citigroup as a problem manager for Latin America and currently here at Roku Collins as the senior specialist in Gold Trade Compliance. If they want to pursue studies or careers in international affairs of one sort or another, whether in the government or in the private sector or in the think tank world or in academia, 
um, that FIU's MAGA program, the Green School's MAGA program, really is a terrific way to, to get started. To the person that is considering the Masters of Global Affairs here at FIU are recommended because it is a program that is tailored to the needs of the global market.